I'm no, I'm looking forward to it. Um, I was, I was very impressed when I looked over Stephanie's jobs and her passions. Uh, she's been involved in a tremendous array of, of different ecological and species monitoring activities. All sorts of birds, reptiles, amphibians, bats, toads, um, arthropods. I was just like, wow, rare plants. I don't think there's anything that she hasn't served. <laughs> She's done a tremendous lot with birds. And um, the other thing that I was very impressed with besides her commitment to ecology and to especially rare and endangered species was that she is connecting all of this together to with the cultural element. And that's something you don't see a lot. A lot of times you see one or the other, but I think this is really important, especially for moving forward to, to try to connect and one of the one of the um, things that made a, a big impression on me was one of the quotes talking about how indigenous peoples protect so much of our biodiversity and the species richness on our planet, and that is certainly not appreciated like it should be. So um, yes, here she is definitely an expert in a very niche field. <laughs> And I feel really fortunate to listen to her presentation tonight. So thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And, you know, hello, everyone. You know, I've heard about rural roots and I was asked to give a presentation last year, but I was just way too overwhelmed with the COVID blowback to do it. And so I'm really happy to be here now. Um, I, I feel like I have to apologize a little bit. This talk is very holistic and there's a little bit of everything in here. And so I'm just going to try to do my best to weave this together. Um, really, this talk is about climate literacy and ecological literacy, human health and land management. And, you know, I talk to a lot of audiences about climate change. And I one thing I've noticed about people when they speak about climate change, they really just define the problem. They don't talk about the abundant solutions or connect that to solving the other problems that we have sort of right now is a very precious time it's a critical time in human history and you know i'm very fortunate to be doing the work that i'm doing and i feel very humble you know i don't have all the answers but um i love talking to people about solutions and, you know, I work for the Nez Perce Tribe. I'm the climate change coordinator. Um, I've been there for about six years. And as Susan mentioned, I'm an ecologist. Part of my background is ac actually agricultural ecology and biodiversity. But um, I'm on the Nez Perce Tribe's food alliance. It's called the HIPT Alliance. That means helping indigenous people thrive. And the tribe has been having, um, you know, local food summits annually during COVID. Um, through a remote platform. And this year, we're really hoping to have one in person in February, um, depending on, you know, how the winter goes. Um, it's just a really fun celebration of local solutions and good ideas and traditional culture and food systems. So I'm going to start going through these slides. Um, you know, whenever I talk about climate change, I really feel like it would be a betrayal to not provide some basic core information about it. Um, this graph is from a paper that was published in 2017 in Nature Communications, and it shows the climate for the last 450 million years. It shows on the lower panel, um, Fahrenheit, you know, change in degrees Fahrenheit, and in the upper panel, change in carbon dioxide. So 450 million years ago, uh, Pacific lambrey showed up in the fossil record. 200 million years ago, sturgeon did. Six million years ago, Pacific salmon did. Um, so if you look at this figure, you know, you can see this red dotted line that's going, you know, up and down. That's when Pacific salmon show up in our evolutionary record. The second panel, B and F, <clears throat> that is after <clears throat> the extinction of the dinosaurs, when the big meteorite hit the planet and 
you know, caused a massive die off of life on this planet. And hold on just one second. Yeah. So, you know, after that happened, the planet really cooled off and significantly, you know, most of our planet's history, it's been quite warm during the period where there were dinosaurs on this planet, there was tropical forest all the way to the poles. Of course, most of the continents were kind of in one big mass in the middle and there was ocean around it. But this is a big change, you know, it's been cold for a long time. In fact, in all of human history, there's been less than 300 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. By 2100, with the business as usual scenario, there could be 1200 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That is actually more carbon dioxide than was in the atmosphere when the dinosaurs went extinct. That is an incredibly huge change in a very small amount of time. When people say, you know, the climate has always changed, that is absolutely true. It is 100% true, and it is very good to know that. But it's also important to know that it's when there are large changes in short amounts of time, there are mass extinctions. And so that's the situation we're in today. So scientists tell us that to have, you know, a safe climate that's what we are adapted to and the species on this planet, we need to get back down to 350 parts per million. And right now we're at about 420. By mid-century, we could be at five or 600. So it's worth it to do everything that we can as rapidly as possible to reduce our carbon footprint. So, you know, just to kind of put this in perspective, um, during the Pleistocene 2.5 million years ago to 1,000, or 11,700 years ago, um, carbon dioxide was about 250 parts per million and most of this region was covered in giant glaciers. Um, the Bonneville floods are what carved out the Snake River Canyon and the Columbia River Gorge. The indigenous people in this area have stories about that event as part of their oral history. They were here and they witnessed it. They probably lost a lot of villages and some people too. The Bonneville flood is when Salt Lake emptied. It took about three weeks for all of the water in this massive lake to flow out to the ocean through the Columbia River Gorge. And for the Nez Perce, that story is Coyote Breaks the Fish Dam at Celilo. And that was the point at which fish started to come further inland, salmon in particular, and, you know, go to new places. The Missoula floods happened between 15,000 and, you know, 13,000 years ago, approximately. And they're shown on this graphic. You can see the water flowing across the Columbia River Basin out towards the Columbia flooding the Willamette. So, you know, the indigenous people that are here today, their ancestors survived a massive change in the climate and an extinction and learned how to manage this landscape sustainably and actually planted food trails and food prairies all over this landscape, which has been one of the most fascinating things about coming here and working for the tribe and learning about their history in this region. So, you know, when we talk about climate change, what does that really mean? You know, <laughs> if we're going to five, 600 parts per million to a thousand parts per million by the end of the century, you know, how do you even visualize that change? Well, as part of our analysis for the tribe, we looked at every climatic factor you could possibly imagine, you know, temperature, April snow depth, um, flow. You know, here's just an example showing how in the future, 
we could go from feet of snow in the mountains to inches of snow by April in 2080, depending on what we do. The same thing, mid-century flow in our rivers is likely to be a lot lower um, because of climate change. We can expect hotter, drier, and longer summers, more forest fires, more extreme heat days, um, really this landscape drying out quite a bit. That obviously has very important implications for our food system, not only for our native wildlife, um, but also for human beings. So the nearest climate analog under a high emission scenario for this place is the Central Valley of California. That's for the Lewis Clark Valley. The nearest climate analog for Lake Spokane is the Lewis Clark Valley. So if you can imagine those dry, lower elevation canyons being what the Palouse is like in the future, um, you know, that's another way to imagine you know, this place having climatic conditions that are more suitable for Central Valley species like oaks than for conifers. So unfortunately, there hasn't been modeling for many of the species that matter the most to the tribe, but there has been a lot of really good modeling for huckleberries. And this is an example of what climate change could mean. So this is advance in flowering and fruiting and range contractions for um, thin leaf huckleberry and black huckleberry. So as you can see, you know, flowering and fruiting will be much earlier. Um, the range of huckleberries will be moving north into Canada and there will be a loss of huckleberry habitat in the lower 48. If you look at those black areas on the panel to the on the far right, you can see that. And that's a really dramatic change for our native wildlife that depend upon huckleberries and also for traditional gatherers. The good news is that right now, after the Inflation Reduction Act, and you know, the election was yesterday, it seems like there was not a red wave. There's sort of a red ripple, um, which hopefully will mean that this policy stays in place. We are headed in the right direction. We're headed towards, you know, much closer to these climate goals that need to be met by 2030 in the United States. And it's possible that, you know, this single act, the Inflation Reduction Act actually changed the game for our climate commitments and will probably have some bearing on what the rest of the world does. Um, there are many good things for homeowners in this to convert to um, much more fuel efficient and electrified appliances in their homes, you know, the way they get around, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there's also a lot in this act about soil health. And a lot of my talk is going to be focused on soil health, actually. So you know, what do you do when you have a giant, huge, crazy problem and you don't really know what the outcome is going to be? You know, where do you start? And this is basically my motto, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. Um, this is our region, our beautiful area, the prairies, the forests, the rivers, the people. This is where we are. And what can we do here that will make a difference? So first of all, we can educate ourselves about climate change, right? I just provided a little overview of the global climate crisis, but you know, that is good to know. That's the why, but the how is actually more important. So <coughs> here's one of my questions, which ecosystems contain the most carbon? And you feel free to put an answer in the chat if you think that you know. Um, the next slide is going to have answers to this, but I'd be curious to see if anybody wants to, you know, ante, ante up and explain 
or take a guess. Is it forests? Is it grasslands? Is it crops? Wetlands, the ocean? I'm just curious if anybody knows. Either grass or wetlands is my bet. Okay, that is an excellent guess. It's wetlands. <laughs> wetlands are the winner by like an order of magnitude. It's ridiculous. Wetlands contain more carbon per, act per hectare or per acre than any other ecosystem. Then boreal forests and then temperate grasslands. And that is before temperate forests and tropical forests, et cetera. And incredibly like crops, well, going back, contain almost as much carbon as forests. When people talk about carbon sequestration, they, I think they think about the forest. They don't necessarily think about wetlands and grasslands, but actually wetlands have an inordinate importance, especially in the West for biodiversity and cultural survival. And, or, the health of our waters. So good to know. So the other thing is to look at what other people are doing in frameworks that might help us. Um, this is from Point Blue Conservation Science. It's their explanation of climate smart principles. Show your work, look forward, but don't ignore the past. Consider the broader context, build ecological insurance, build evolutionary resilience, include the human community, monitor and experiment. This is the framework that they use for their students and teachers restoring a watershed program and for their restoration projects. I'm gonna explain this a little bit more. So we have three Climate Smart projects at the tribe. The first one is the Climate Smart Agriculture Project. The second one is this Climate Smart Restoration Toolkit. And the third one is actually this landscape level climate change adaptation um, pro planning project called the Camas to Condors Project. So with the Climate Smart Agriculture Project, you know, my little group asked ourselves, how can we complement what is already being done by the tribe, by farmers, and help our local economy and the tribe adapt to climate change? We came upon educating ourselves and others, researching various agricultural techniques that might help store soil carbon and improve food security, lowering barriers for adoption for farmers, creating new partnerships and networks of people working together, um, help with funding, reward early adopters. We have some really awesome farmers on the reservation that are really doing right by their soil and making a difference. We'd like to figure out how to reward them. Monitor and, you know, trying to figure out how to get, help farmers get paid to store carbon in their soil. <clears throat> so this is crazy, but the largest human land use is agriculture. Far and away, humans have converted more land to grow food than anything else and desertified more land. And basically, if we can increase soil carbon by 2% on 40% of Earth's arable land, we can sequester all of the excess carbon in the atmosphere. That is so stunning. It's almost hard to believe. And there's a lot of really good papers out now about how this could be done, about whether or not it's really true, um, et cetera, et cetera. I'm gonna talk about a method that anyone can do in their backyard but also this group called Kiss the Ground that's doing education about soil health and soil carbon storage. There are many agricultural practices that could be adopted in our area that could make a difference. You know, everything from cover cropping and managed grazing to no-till. The Nez Perce Reservation has about a 70%, 70 to 80% adoption of no-till farming. And the rest of this landscape has about a 20% adoption rate. And that is in part because of a successful project in which the, far, the tribe worked with NRCS to lower barriers and help farmers in order to protect water quality. 
So <clears throat> David Johnson is one of the soil scientists looking at soil carbon sequestration. He's from New Mexico. I'm from New Mexico. So this is near and dear to my heart because he did a lot of experiments on um, desertification. And basically he created this composting system that makes highly diverse compost that's fungal dominant. He was studying soil and what he realized is that weedy soils are full of bacteria and crop soils are full of bacteria, but native soils and healthy soils are full of fungus. And so he developed a very simple method to make compost that's fungal dominant and then added it to crops, to the desert, <clears throat> to seeds, um, you know, put it under half of a fruit tree and let the, the other half of the fruit tree go without it to see what would happen. And incredibly, what he found was that just by adding fungus back to the desert in New Mexico, if there was a seed bank with native seeds, the prairies would come back. This is incredible, right? But he also found that this system of using this compost was more productive than conventional farming and organic farming. It could actually increase the productivity of the farmlands that we're already using. I would highly recommend watching his talk. Um, it's in the EcoFarm keynote and I put a link in this in the slide deck. So why, why fungus? And why soil biodiversity? <clears throat> Mycorrhizae increases the capacity of roots to absorb nutrients by thousands of times. It makes our foods more nutritious and it helps um, native ecosystems thrive. In a lot of traditional cultures, people are told to pay attention to what's beneath the ground and not just what's above it and value the soil and what's the life within it. This system is pretty easy to build. Um, it's basically a compost bin that is aerated and watered. There are instructions, I put a link here, but um, it's interesting. This is a lot of text, but in essence, you know, they put, they did these experiments. This is an example. Comparing conventional no-till corn production using 250 pounds of nitrogen per acre to a beam treatment. They reduced the nitrogen by 85% down to about 38 pounds of nitrogen per acre and added two pounds of the compost per acre as an abstract injected into the furrows when they planted the corn. Through the microscope, we saw that we were putting about 80 billion bacteria and 10 million fungal spore. We were, they were putting 80 billion bacteria and 10 million fungal spores per square foot. At the end of the year, they produced 218 bushels of corn on the conventional plot and the same amount on the plot treated with beam using 85% less nitrogen. With no nitrogen at all, they had a 6.6% reduction in productivity. So with this system, they managed to get 140 plus pounds of nitrogen from somewhere. And the thing about healthy soil is that it helps convert nitrogen to something that plants can use. A lot of the fertilizers that we put on our landscapes are literally to try to get enough nitrogen to plant so that they will grow. And he proved that there's another way to do this. That's really important in the systems that we're talking about right in our area. This isn't the only method, it's just one method, but it's something that anyone can do in their yard or on their farm. And it's cheap. Okay, here's another thing. The Land Institute in Kansas has been studying crops, row crops and grains for a long time. They took annual winter wheat and they back crossed it with its perennial ancestor. 
As you can see from this figure, perennial wheatgrass has roots that are much, much more extensive than the annual wheat that's grown on most of our prairies. The thing about perennial crops is that you don't have to till and disturb the soil. So what they found is that these root systems continue to grow and convey water and nutrients deeper and deeper into the ground. If you can imagine the amount of carbon that's in a system that's perennial versus a system that's annual, the difference is tremendous and has tremendous implications for flood control and soil health for farmers. Patagonia Provisions has now turned this particular grain called Kernza into a beer. Others have turned it into a bread product. So this is a solution that's come to market and Clearwater Seeds is growing this grain locally. Some farmers are growing heirloom grains and other grains to try to, you know, increase the health of their soil and to have a value add product to put on the market. Um, there's a farmer in the reservation that's doing a completely different <coughs> system, but it also involves intercropping and cover cropping and getting deep roots into the soil. So the first research project that we're doing at the tribe with the University of Idaho is looking at different cover crop mixes and manure management systems for a farmer that has a manure management problem. So we're, we've got our plots, we've done our first soil samples, and then the farmer is going to, uh, has been composting manure, either actively, passively, or not not doing any compost and he's going to spread, he's going to plant the seeds and spread these treatments, active manure, passive manure, passively composted, actively composted and you know not composted. And then what he usually do, does, which is fertilizer and a control on four cover crop mixes and Timothy hay. Then we're gonna take samples afterwards and see what happens. We're trying to figure out which of these methods would help him deal with his manure problem, increase his soil health, and hopefully come up with cover crops to graze his cattle on. Next year, we should have some results to report from this, but this is one of the things that we're trying to do here. How can we lower barriers? What will work with our soil types? What works locally? How can we manage waste to make a difference for agriculture for our farmers here? All right, so I talked about root systems and root systems have an inordinate amount of importance for water storage in landscapes and drought. The farmer on the reservation that's using this system called bioactive of his own accord, last year during the worst drought ever, harvested a crop. He harvested garbanzos and wheat and a cover crop. And after he harvested his cover crop, his cover crop re-sprouted and he was grazing on it. His farm had the only flowers on the landscape for miles around last summer. It was so impressive. Part of what he's doing is adding carbon back into the soil by capturing um, exhaust from the tractor and mixing it with a soil inoculant and then injecting that into the soil. But he's also cover cropping. And this is a simple illustration produced by Kiss the Ground that shows the difference between having living plants in the ground and not having them and what happens with water. For every 1% increase in organic matter, there's as much as 25,000 gallons of soil water available per acre. So storing carbon in the soil doesn't just matter for our climate, it matters for water and water quality and water availability. And after looking at those flow projections for the future, 
and the soil moisture projections, we really think it's important to start investing more and more in soil health in our farmers. Here's another thing. <clears throat> Even a small on-farm wetland can make a difference for the climate, for water storage, for biodiversity, for water quality, and for flood control. Um, you know, Idaho has lost 390,000 acres, 380,000 acres of wetlands since colonization. There were wetlands everywhere, and there were many, many species that depended upon them. Even wetlands that don't look like they're perfect for wildlife, you know, they're in the middle of farms, can actually make a huge difference for wildlife habitat. So it's worth it to think about that. It's also important to think about wetland restoration for many other species and riparian restoration. And fortunately, there's a lot of that work already going on. Um, wetland restoration and stream restoration can cool down waterways and help fish come back. Fish used to fertilize this entire landscape and fed all of the species within it, including the soil. And so the tribe focuses a huge amount on stream temperature, in-stream <laughs> habitat, et cetera, from fish. What we said is if people are already doing a lot of riparian restoration in this area, how can we increase the cultural relevance of that work? How can we make that work climate smart? How can we focus on the other species that could benefit and not just fish? So we, you know, Point Blue Conservation Science is this organization I used to work for. They're based in Marin County in California and they focus on bird conservation. But they have this one project that's really cool where they took a, they made a simple planting tool. It's an Excel spreadsheet where they have the ecological attributes of a number of species within the toolkit. And it allows you to analyze what benefits you might be getting when you plant certain species in a riparian or wetland restoration project. But what we said was, you know what, this toolkit is awesome. It's so needed. It would be so helpful for looking at what we're doing, but it's missing culture. The wetlands and riparian areas in this region are extremely important for cultural gatherers and for people that, you know, build traditional things and do construction with plants. One of those things, for instance, is tule mats. Tule mats are very important for burials and there used to be tule everywhere in this area and now there's hardly any tule. Um, there are many other species of wetland plants that occur in this region that I'm not, I'm not going to talk about particular species and why they're important to the tribe. Just to say that these habitats are very important to the tribe. And we tried to create a toolkit that would allow people to increase their species diversity and their restoration plantings so that they could include culture in this work. Here's an example of you know, a traditional planting design with a few species and a climate smart design. By using this toolkit, restoration practitioners in our division can increase the number of species with fruits or flowers or other resources for wildlife over a greater part of the year. <laughs> as seasons change and as, well, as wildlife are on the move, it's gonna be necessary to provide food resources over a greater period of time and to increase biological diversity so that there is sort of redundancy built into ecosystems. The same thing applies to soil. The healthier soil is, the more microorganisms are, the more adaptable it is. Same thing with riparian systems, same thing with salmonids. The more different life history strategies there are for salmonids, the more salmon there are alive, the greater the chance that there will be individuals that will be able to adapt to huge changes. All right. So the other thing is that, you know, looking at future climate analogs, we realized that species are already on the move. Wildlife, plants, insects, birds, etc. People, human beings. 
um, entire ecosystems, and that that's going to increase in the future. And so we're also doing a project that's a landscape level climate change adaptation planning project looking at connectivity, you know, helping animals on the move and on um, increasing opportunities for gatherers. It's called the Canvas to Condors Project. It's a partnership between the tribe and a number of regional non nonprofits, um, including Yellowstone to Yukon, Greater Hells Canyon Council, Eastern Oregon Legacy Lands, the Network for Landscape Conservation, and multiple divisions at the tribe. The point of this project is to try to, you know, focus uh, landscape level restoration on cultural species and holistic land management. Canvas and condors are really just symbols. Um, you know, the Nez Perce Tribes Wildlife Division is trying to reintroduce California <laughs> condor to this region, to the Hell's Canyon region, which would be a climate smart thing to do because right now, you know, there's less than 500 California condors in existence and all of them are in very similar climate baskets with a lot of the same threats. Hell's Canyon would be ideal because it's got a lot of elevational diversity and topological diversity. It's further north, there's wolves and other ways for them to get food that are lead free. And there's a huge amount of protected land in this region. The Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative is focused on species like grizzly bears that really need a large area to roam and they need connected habitats and education to reduce human wildlife conflicts. So what they do is they tie together a bunch of smaller projects into a greater whole to try to increase connectivity over the landscape. The idea is not that they do it all, the idea is that they put everybody that's working on various conservation projects together so that they can achieve larger goals. This seemed like a good model to work over, you know, the Nez Perce Tribes Indian Claims Commission and usual and accustomed areas because it's a really huge area. And so we started this project and I'd encourage you to look up the story map and learn more about it. But it's just one more example of something that's climate smart. So one of the most interesting um, kind of funny comments that I've heard in a TED talk was about, you know, how native prairies are great, they're wonderful, but there's not enough food in them to feed the world, so to speak. And, you know, one of the things that I like to say about this region is that we're feeding the world, but we're not really feeding ourselves. This is an image of Zumwalt Prairie. <laughs> It's beautiful. It's an, the largest intact native grassland in this region. And incidentally, it was wild tended. There are sites in this prairie that people recognize that must have been tended by their ancestors because there are so many native foods that are put together. In this image, there are many native foods, foods that people used to subsist upon for millennial for millennia. This prairie also absorbs water and carbon and stores it and prevents floods and provides habitat for native pollinators and many, many species of wildlife. This is one of the most raptor rich parts of our region. It's extremely important for wildlife and biodiversity conservation in our area. I like to go to this place because it reminds me of what we're missing and what we could have and where we can go. It might not be that our entire landscape is converted back to native ecosystems. It could be that there are just strips of native ecosystems along riparian areas and ditches and within fields to increase pollinator diversity. It's also notable that this, these native prairies produce foods that are extremely nutrient dense. That all of that healthy soil and the mycorrhizae within it actually conveys more nutrients into these plants and provides greater health for the people that eat them and that are adapted to eat them. 
this person is my staff person. She's a traditional gatherer. And this, in this image, she is gathering camas. I think it's also important to know that our health, human health depends upon biodiversity. There's now really good research out, you know, connecting missing microbes and microbial communities with a number of autoimmune diseases and other health conditions. Um, here's a graph showing the incidence of celiac disease between 1990 and 2010. This is a published paper. And as you can see, the incidence of celiac disease has increased an incredible amount with the addition of spraying wheat with glyphosate. Glyphosate, as many of you probably know, is a weed killer that was invented by Monsanto to try to help us control weeds. Here's the incidence of other diseases since glyphosate started to be sprayed on crops. Thyroid cancer, Parkinson's, Crohn's disease, autism, hypertension, and cancer. One thing that I think is very, very important is to remember that we can trust nature, that we evolved with it, that we're a part of it, that nature is incredibly creative and has solutions for many of our problems. And, you know, the way that we grow food now does not mimic nature. And there are many solutions that help prevent this situation. Thank you.